Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, before I begin, I just want to, to echo some of the thanks, uh, offer my thanks to Liz Bird and Liz Kisak at the Humanities Institute uh, for setting up this wonderful lecture series and, more importantly, for inviting me to take a part in it. Um, as, as Dr. Tobin said, my talk today is uh, drawn from my recently published book, Stories of the South, Race and the Reconstruction of Southern Identity, 1865 to 1915. And I want to start tonight with the story of a story. In 1887, the African-American author Charles Chestnut published a short story called The Gooford Grapevine in the Atlantic Monthly, the era's most significant literary magazine. The Gooford Grapevine opens with the meeting of two men, John, a northern white man interesting, interested in purchasing the old McAdoo plantation in North Carolina, and Uncle Julius, an ex-slave and the plantation's oldest resident who has no interest in sharing his home with a northern interloper. Technically, Julius has no claim on the plantation. He has no title and no legal means of keeping John from completing the purchase. Incapable of preventing the transaction by conventional means, Uncle Julius turns to the most powerful tool at his disposal, his ability to tell stories. Aware that John is particularly interested in the plantation's vineyard, Julius asks him to sit down and proceeds to spin a tale of a time before the war when the plantation's grapevines had been goofered or cursed by a conjure woman. Julius concludes his tale with a stern warning. John should not buy the plantation because the goofer was still on the grapevines. It could crop up at any moment. Well, John purchases the plantation anyway and soon learns Julius' true purpose, protecting a lucrative grape selling operation that he had been running since the Civil War. Other stories in Charles Chestnut's series of conjure tales display a similar logic. In one story, Uncle Julius uses a tale to prevent John from knocking down an old meeting house. In another, a story gains employment for Julius' ne'er-do-well grandson. In a third, Julius wins a new set of clothes. In each case, Julius uses a conjure tale as a means to achieving a desired and very tangible end. The entire tale becomes a smokescreen that Julius uses to hide and advance his secret agenda. In Charles Chestnut's Conjure Tales, storytelling and power are inextricably linked. Julius does not use his stories to uh, describe the world as it actually is. Instead, he relies upon his tales to shape that world and to advance his place in it. Stories are not value-neutral, feel-good yarns to be told and forgotten soon thereafter. They are, in fact, potent cultural weapons, layered with political intention and fraught with social meaning. In a sense, my book takes up where Charles Chestnut's Conjure Tales leave off, insisting on the inextricability of storytelling and power in the post-Civil War U.S. South. In my book, I use the study of late 19th and early 20th century print, visual and performance culture to address an important historical riddle. How did a nation that fought a civil war, emancipated the slaves, and set about reconstructing the defeated South along egalitarian and democratic lines turn its back on race relations in the vanquished region in less than half a century? By all measures, Reconstruction was a moment of remarkable change in an era of radical possibility. In a few short years, in the mid-1860s, African Americans won their freedom, their citizenship, and the ballot. The South's political structures became, for the first time, truly biracial and democratic, with black voting and black office holding reaching unprecedented levels. By the first years of the 20th century, however, the tide had turned. Barely two decades after the removal of the last federal troops from the South in 1877, Southern white supremacists had perfected an elaborate and flexible system of physical segregation, political disfranchisement, and systematic racial violence collectively known as Jim Crow. The federal government, for the most part, did nothing. The Northern public watched with equanimity. It is this seismic shift from the egalitarian promise of Reconstruction to the nightmare of Jim Crow that I attempt to explain. However, rather than turning to high politics, to presidential elections and congressional debates, in search of an answer to this riddle, I look elsewhere, to the realm of culture, to stories. 
By stories, I don't just mean works of literature like Charles Chestnut's Conjure Tales, though I do analyze those at some length. I refer to stories in the broadest sense of the world as an attempt to explain and communicate information. In this case, my storytellers strive to explain the nature of the South, understood as a region, a people, and a civilization. In my book, The Shifting Answers to a Single Question, What is the South? Mark out a new path for understanding the racial history of the postbellum United States. By any measure, the Civil War transforms the South. The war left hundreds of thousands of people dead, destroyed one of the most prolific slave-based agricultural regimes the world has ever known, and smashed the dream of a separate Southern nation. In the process, it inaugurated the greatest social revolution in American history, turning four million African American slaves into free people. However, the Civil War also had effects that were not quite so tangible. Antebellum notions of Southern identity did not survive the nation's great conflict. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the character of the South, even its persistence as a culturally distinctive region of the United States, was very much an open issue. The South, as it had been, was no more. The question was what would take its place. The 50 years after the Civil War saw the construction of a new identity for the region, the birth of a new vision of the South. On both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, in cultural productions ranging from speeches to travel guides to novels to theatrical performances, Northerners and Southerners, black and white, debated contested and ultimately reimagined the meaning of the South. Out of the ashes of the Civil War, a new South would emerge. Defining the character of that South would prove to be a central concern of the post-war era. In part, uh, my book is, is rooted in a dissatisfaction with the way that historians generally tell the history of the late 19th century United States and the retreat from Reconstruction. Too often, the, the literature of this, of this period, and this is particularly true of, of textbook literature, I think, too often the literature of this period treats the betrayal of Reconstruction as a fairly reductive process. Northerners tire of meddling in Southern affairs, and after the end of Reconstruction in 1877, turn to their own Gilded Age pursuits, urbanization, industrialization, immigration, labor strife, leaving white Southerners to redraw the racial line in the South. Such a reading, I think, reduces the egalitarianism of Reconstruction to a passing fancy, a 12-year aberration. Beyond this, it gives the North a pass on the more unsavory aspects of late 19th century race politics. Jim Crow was born in the South, but the nation watched at every step of the way. By taking my story beyond the traditional end of Reconstruction in 1877, I insist that African American disfranchisement, lynching, and segregation were never natural or inevitable. They were instead the ever contested result of long-term trends and negotiations. The North paid attention to Southern affairs long after 1877 and was well aware of and largely acquiescent in the turn taken in Southern race politics after the rise of Jim Crow. Northern complicity in the rise of segregation and disfranchisement requires an explanation, and popular culture, the shifting meaning of the South in the American imagination, provides the answer. I argue that by examining popular debates over the character of the South in the five decades after the Civil War, we can better make sense of the nation's abandonment of the egalitarian possibilities of Reconstruction. The South, simply put, was not the same place in 1915 as it was in 1865. If the boundaries of the region had not changed, its place in US culture most certainly had. A deeply troubling cultural distinctiveness had become the source of the South's literary popularity and economic appeal. A chronic inability to accept changes in race relations had been transformed into a widely accepted racial expertise a dangerous enemy had become a staunch ally. When Americans looked south at the turn of the 20th century, they saw, or thought they saw, a region transformed. 
In making this case, Stories of the South mines the popular print and visual culture of the post-war era, finding historical and political significance in texts, events, and conversations not usually privileged in discussions of Reconstruction and its aftermath. Post-war discussion of the South occurred in a cultural sphere that extended far beyond presidential proclamations and congressional debates. In newspapers, journal articles, travel guides, investment catalogs, photographs, cartoons, short stories, novels, plays, poems, songs, memoirs, histories, learned monographs, and lurid exposés, Americans grappled with the character of the South. At spectacular expositions and at the minstrel theater, in churches and at lectures, on southern tours and in northern living rooms, they described, discussed, and debated southern affairs. Indeed, references to the southern question were ever present in the post-Civil War period. Like the conjure tales of Uncle Julius, each of these stories of the South was tied to considerations of power. Stories reflect social and political realities but they also help to create them. Across the five decades under consideration in the book, a general movement from northern to white southern control of the southern question is discernible. In the immediate aftermath of Confederate defeat, northern Republicans assumed the power to redefine the South. Reconstruction was, in part, an attempt to create in the South a society that more closely aligned with northern values and expectations. Over time, however, uh, conservative white Southerners came to recognize the value of a well-told story. In the years after 1877, the white South began to construct visions of their region expressly for Northern consumption. White Northerners, for their part, proved increasingly willing to defer to their Southern brethren. By the time the White South began to construct the machinery of Jim Crow in the 1890s, the very terrain on which North and South met had been forever altered. Despite the best efforts of African-American activists and white racial liberals, Southern white supremacists claimed the exclusive right to explain their region to the nation. As they stripped black voters of the ballot and drew a color line through the public spaces of the South, white Southerners harnessed the power of culture to ward off renewed federal intervention in Southern race relations. In seeking to explain federal non-action in the face of Jim Crow in the 1890s and the early 1900s, we need to account for the shifting place of the South in the nation's popular imagination. Taken together, the close readings and historical analysis I have presented in my book provide fresh insights into the history of the post-war South and the nation's retreat from Reconstruction. By tracing the ways in which definitions of the South shifted over time, I have recreated the cultural universe in which Americans flirted with and ultimately abandoned the promise of racial democracy. Between 1865 and 1915, Northern and Southern storytellers reimagined the South. This process, fraught, disputed, and contested, is the subject of my book, Its Own Story of the South. So with that sort of by way of, of introduction, um, at this point, I'd like to shift gears in, in the hopes of making this all a little bit more concrete. As I mentioned before, a central argument of my book is the idea that the South is not the same place in 1865 and 1915, at least in the popular imagination of Americans. So if we asked a man or a woman in New York or Boston or Cleveland, what is the South? at various moments in time, in 1865, in 1882, in 1903, their answers would have varied widely. Beyond this, they would have turned to different texts and narratives and events in an attempt to answer that question. The stories about the South to which they had access, the stories about the South that they told, would have changed significantly across time. These shifts, I argue, have everything to do with the nation's retreat from Reconstruction, and the betrayal of racial egalitarianism in the United States. But I don't expect you to simply believe me, so I thought I'd show you what I mean. Um, I'll go about this in two ways in the remainder of this lecture. First, we'll look at a few sets of images. Each pairing features a similar subject depicted at different chronological moments. I think you'll very clearly see the passage of time and the changing notions of the South that are reflected in each pairing. 
After this, I'll talk at some length about the fate of a particular cultural form, stage productions of Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Again, um, my interest here is in what these works tell us about the ways that the nation understood the South and Southerners. In other words, as we're looking at these images and, and talking about these cultural forms, I want you to be asking this the all important question, what is the South? How do these texts, how do these, these uh, cultural works answer this question, what is the South? These images open the first chapter of my book. They're photographs taken in April of 1865. These first two were taken by a photographer named Alexander Gardner in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, shortly after the evacuation of the Confederate Army in early April of 1865. This third image comes from a guy named George Barnard and depicts the devastation in Charleston, South Carolina, where the first shots of the Civil War had been fired four years before. These images depict a South in ruin. In photographic views of Southern desolation and nothingness, the nation caught a glimpse of the challenge and the opportunity of reconstruction. From the Northern perspective, the sins of the South, slavery and secession, had brought about its complete and total devastation. This fate was just and deserved. The question in 1865 was how to rebuild the South, to replace its civilization with one that was purer, higher, better, which more often than not meant more Northern. Okay, fast forward 30 years to 1895, and the New York-based magazine Puck prints this image as its two-page centerfold. You probably recognize the, the right half of that image. Um, the occasion for this was the 1895 Cotton States and Industrial Exposition held in Atlanta, Georgia. The event is most famous for being the site of African-American educator Booker T. Washington's famous Atlanta Compromise speech. But it was much more than this. The, 18, uh, the 1895 exposition was something of a coming out party for a new South. Atlanta's boosters invited the nation to come to Georgia to see the spectacular progress that the region had made since the end of Reconstruction. It would appear that the cartoonist for Puck was convinced. The image presents an idealized utopian vision of the South. It celebrates in the, forefront, uh, in the foreground reunion between blue and gray Civil War veterans. It depicts a free and contented African-American population in an integrated setting with the word prosperity hovering over a sparkling landscape in the background. The South, it depicts, is redeemed, rejuvenated, reformed, ready for the future. It is worth asking, however, what else happened in the South in 1895? By that year, several southern states, including Mississippi and South Carolina, had rewritten their state constitutions to disfranchise African-American voters. The rest of the region would soon follow suit. Segregation of public space, notably trains and streetcars, had picked up steam in the late 1880s and early 1890s. A year later, in 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court would declare separate but equal accommodations to be constitutional in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. In the year 1895, when that image appeared, more than 100 African Americans were lynched in the South. And yet Puck Magazine presented that image of the South to its readership. How about popular depictions of white Southerners? For much of Reconstruction, images like this one were quite common. This image, drawn by Thomas Nast, the most famous cartoonist of the period, depicts the 1876 election in South Carolina, which was widely recognized to be fraudulent and extraordinarily violent. The image depicts two white Southerners using their pistols to force a black man to vote for the Democratic Party. That's the party of white supremacy and the end of Reconstruction. The figure on the far right here, floppy hat, pointy nose, chin whiskers, arm to the teeth, malice from head to foot, is a pretty fair approximation of Thomas Nast's standard depiction of white Southerners for most of the Reconstruction period. What a surprise then is this image, published in 1882. Here, Thomas Nast has again personified the white South, but this sketch of the queen of industry is a far cry from the floppy hat and chin whiskers. 
Here, the New South quietly mines a loom. Violence, electoral fraud, and racial oppression would appear to be the furthest thing from her mind. So how are we to understand the white residents of the South? What is a Southerner? When Northern voters pondered the future course of racial affairs in the South, particularly the degree to which the federal government should involve itself, who are they dealing with? Chin whiskers or the queen of industry? A similar logic is at work if we look at popular depictions of Southern African Americans. We start with this image. Franchise, published in Harper's Weekly in August of 1865. In it, Columbia, the symbol of the United States, pleads that a black Union veteran be given the right to vote. His service to his country, the image suggests, demands full citizenship and the right of suffrage. Since many of the black men who joined Union regiments during the Civil War were themselves former slaves from the South, this image makes a powerful statement about the future of the region. The right to vote, it suggests, is something that has been earned through blood and service. Needless to say, franchise is a far cry from this image, which was printed in the New York-based Collier's Weekly in 1898. The race disturbance at Wilmington, North Carolina, that the picture purports to represent was, in fact, a white supremacist coup and a massacre of the town's black population. A mob of some 2,000 white men marched through Wilmington, North Carolina, overthrew the legitimately elected local government, burned the black section of town, and killed somewhere between 15 and 60 African Americans. In the retelling, however, the black residents of Wilmington became the aggressors, an armed mob that threatened the safety of the white women of Wilmington. Such was the power of Southern stories. Once again, this transition is crucial. What is the South as depicted in these images? Who are its residents? Who has earned civil and political rights? Who has a legitimate claim on the federal government? One final pairing here. Two images of the Ku Klux Klan. For those who don't know, the Ku Klux Klan was an organization of white supremacist terrorists devoted to the overthrow of African American suffrage and the defeat of the Republican Party across the South during Reconstruction. As this image suggests, their trademark was a nighttime visit to Republican homes where residents might be threatened, uh, threatened beaten, raped, or killed. Frank Ballou's 1872 image, A Visit of the Ku Klux, powerfully captures the deeply personal nature of this form of racial terrorism. Our second image is this one, a still from the 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation. Those of you who were here last week heard David Goldfield, uh, Goldfield talk at some length about this film. Uh, the Birth of a Nation was a landmark in American cinema history. It was over three hours long and was unlike any movie produced up to that time. It took the Civil War and Reconstruction as its subject and it made heroes of the Ku Klux Klan. In the film's version of Reconstruction, black suffrage has brought about an orgy of misrule, corruption, and sexual danger. In the film's climactic scene, armed Klansmen overthrow the elected government, robbing African Americans of the right to vote and effectively ending Reconstruction. It bears repeating at this point that the Klan are the heroes in this film. In this still from the movie, uh, the Klan prepares to lynch Gus, a black Union soldier who has attempted to rape a young white girl. The Birth of a Nation was extraordinarily popular north of the Mason-Dixon line. It stayed in many theaters for more than a year. What stories of the South do these two images tell us? What is the nature of this region? In thinking about the nation's response to Southern racial affairs in the post-Civil War period, we need to take these stories into account. What is the South? Do we look left or do we look right? Think back to that, those men and women in New York or Boston or Cleveland. How would they have answered the question, what is the South? To what stories would they have turned? What stories would they have told? 
Perhaps the most important question of all, how would these stories have affected the way they understood race in the United States from Reconstruction to the rise of Jim Crow? These stories, I suggest, matter a great deal. In this uh, final portion of, of my lecture tonight, um, I'd like to walk you through the history of a single cultural form. Many of you are likely familiar with Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, originally released in 1852. You're likely less familiar with the novel's many stage adaptations, the first of which appeared soon after the novel's publication in the 1850s. Theatrical performances of Uncle Tom's Cabin retains their popularity well into the post-Civil War era. Across the decades, however, the content and message of these productions shifted in significant and surprising ways. The strange career of Uncle Tom's Cabin tells us quite a bit about the changing place of the South in the national imagination, particularly regarding issues of race and the memory of slavery. When it was released in 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin quickly became the most significant literary text of the 19th century. Thank you. <laughs> the novel's main plot line uh, follows the path of two Kentucky slaves, Eliza on your left, uh, Eliza who escapes north to avoid the sale of her young son, and Uncle Tom on the right, sold south to pay his master's debts. Tom's southern journey occurs in two stages. He's owned first by the kindly St. Clairs before being sold southwards once more to the Louisiana plantation of Simon Legree. 19th century readers thrilled to Eliza's escape across the frozen Ohio River. They were moved by Uncle Tom's tender relationship with little Eva St. Clair, and they grieved at Tom's brutal death at the hands of Simon Legree. Such emotions served Harriet Beecher Stowe's larger political motivations. The novel presented a powerful indictment of slavery. It also sold books. Uncle Tom's Cabin was the best-selling novel and the second best-selling book of the 19th century. Guesses on the best-selling book? The Bible. Yes, yeah, very good. Second best-selling book to the Bible in the 19th century. Adapted to the stage shortly after its publication, Uncle Tom's Cabin's moral fervor, emotional power, and iconic characters soon made it a theatrical institution. Antebellum productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin largely fell into two categories. Most followed George Aiken's 1852 dramatic adaptation, which was faithful to the novel's plot and to its author's abolitionist intentions. Some productions, however, explicitly, explicitly sought to discredit and undercut Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery message. Southern propagandists, for example, offered pro-slavery dramatic adaptations of Uncle Tom's Cabin in the years before the Civil War. Regardless, the political content of the play remained its defining characteristic in the antebellum period. Love it or loathe it, Uncle Tom's Cabin made a powerful statement on the stage as surely as on the page. By the 1880s, however, which is where we're really going to pick this up, a curious thing had happened. Stage productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin remains popular, but the political edge had largely evaporated. In place of politics, postbellum productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin, often called Tom Shows, came to emphasize display and spectacle. Tom Shows competed to offer the largest cast, the most sumptuous scenery, and the most unique novelties. Where antebellum audiences had mourned for Uncle Tom and cursed Simon Legree, Gilded Age crowds cheered for trained Siberian bloodhounds and spectacular plantation dance routines. At the post-war Tom Show, in fact, the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin largely disappeared, becoming little more than a vehicle for stage trickery and ostentatious display. In the process, the political content that had once defined the production became increasingly peripheral to the play's message. The transition from the abolitionism of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the novel, to the empty spectacle of the Gilded Age Tom Show offers an interesting chapter in the cultural history of the United States. 
More than this, it provides a unique perspective on the nation's declining commitment to African American rights and a prime example of the role that popular culture played in that transition. It has been estimated that there were nearly 500 Uncle Tom's Cabin companies on tour in the 1890s, meaning that the passage of Uncle Tom companies through the major cities and towns of the North was a fairly regular occurrence. Those residents of Detroit, for instance, who missed J. Ryle's company in early October of 1881, only needed to wait one week before Jarrett's version of Uncle Tom's Cabin rolled into town. During the 1893 theatrical season, San Francisco theatergoers could have seen no less than four different traveling Tom shows. Given this extraordinarily crowded marketplace, it was incumbent upon each Uncle Tom's Cabin company to do more than simply entertain. Tom shows were under constant pressure to update, expand, innovate. However, the familiarity of the Uncle Tom's Cabin story to the vast majority of audience members meant that it would have been exceedingly difficult for companies to offer much that was new when it came to the plot, the script, or the characters. So, Tom shows maintained the familiar storyline while resorting to a variety of strategies designed to provide audiences with a show worth their time and money. In the competitive theatrical world of the late 19th century, size sold. Promoters loudly trumpeted the expanse and expense of their productions in the hopes of attracting audiences. In 1895, the aptly named Stowe and Company, no relation, the aptly named Stowe and Company uh, proclaimed itself the, quote, largest and best in the world, boasting that it required, quote, three special cars to transport this, the world's great Uncle Tom's cabin. The E.O. Rogers Company promised 50 performers, while a production of the ideal Uncle Tom's Cabin Company boasted a cast of 80. C.H. Smith wasn't kidding when he promised a double mammoth Uncle Tom's Cabin Company. His show featured more than 100 performers. Though production may have featured only a dozen speaking roles, companies filled out their cast lists and padded their choruses in order to stake a claim on being the biggest and most spectacular Tom show around. This emphasis on scale uh, led to one of the most peculiar developments in the Tom show. The so-called double company. True to their name, double companies featured two actors playing one role during a single production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Never really figured out how that worked. <laughs> it's a big deal. Two actors playing a single role during a single performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Most often this honor was reserved for the two comedic characters in the play, Topsy and Lawyer Marx. In Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Topsy the Slave Girl was a humorous, though ultimately redemptive character, while Marx was a scheming slave trader. In the play, both were transformed into lowbrow comedic figures. Since both characters were traditional audience favorites, Tom Show promoters seem to have assumed that two would be better than one. By the early 1880s, any Tom Show worth its salt was able to boast two Topsies and two Marks. A Detroit newspaper announced the imminent arrival of an Uncle Tom company with the headline, quote, We've another Uncle Tom's cabin snap, a double-headed one, too. No Tom show was complete without its traveling menagerie. A centerpiece of the Uncle Tom's cabin stage show was the slave mother Eliza's daring dash to freedom across the frozen Ohio River. In order to add interest and realism to the scene, Tom shows employed trained dogs to chase the fugitive across the stage. In typical fashion, companies began to compete to offer the largest and most exotic canine contingent. A thrilling chase scene featuring a uh, pack of, quote, imported trained Negro hunting Siberian bloodhounds, all in caps, or something similar, quickly became an expected part of every production. Individual Tom Show dogs even won a degree of fame. A particularly impressive hound named Sultan was reportedly a favorite of ex-president Ulysses S. Grant and the subject of a $3,000 standing offer from Buffalo Bill Cody. Donkeys, generally associated with the character Marx, were also a central part of many Tom Shows. One company featured, quote, the celebrated trick donkey Jerry, while another offered, quote, Knox, the smallest donkey on the stage. 
Miniature ponies, usually the property of Little Eva, often rounded out a Tom Show's animal contingent. By 1892, when an advertisement for an upcoming Tom Show blithely noted that, quote, the usual amounts of dogs, ponies, donkeys, etc., will be carried, animals were as much a part of stage productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin as Tom, Little Eva, or Simon Legree. Many Uncle Tom's Cabin companies went to even more elaborate lengths to attract patronage. Magni uh, magnificent stage pictures or tableau often punctuated performances. The death of Little Eva was transformed into a spectacular set piece featuring hosts of angels and a graceful ascension into heaven. Stetson's Uncle Tom's Cabin Company carried special lighting with them in order to do justice to their depiction of, quote, Ava's ascent to the Golden Realms, also all in caps. Other productions turned to less celestial topics in their search for spectacle. Peck and Fursman's Uncle Tom's Cabin Company staged a reenactment of a boat race between two Mississippi River steamers featuring, quote, two complete practical working models of these famous boats. For those of you not up on your stow, the novel does not feature a steamboat race in any way, shape, or form. Perhaps the most bizarre Tom Show stage spectacle occurred during a production that featured the black Australian boxer Peter Jackson in the role of Uncle Tom. Though critics, uh, though critics praised Jackson's theatrical skills, audiences were more interested in his pugilistic ones. A three-round boxing exhibition proves the highlight of each performance. Given the Tom Show's wholehearted embrace of spectacle, it's unsurprising that grand plantation scenes were staged with some frequency. It is here that we must grapple with the striking connections between postbellum Tom Shows and blackface minstrelsy, the 19th century's most popular style of mass entertainment. Through sectional conflict, civil war, emancipation, and reconstruction, white performers dressed in blackface makeup delighted northern audiences with their plantation sketches and their racial caricatures. From the antebellum period on, minstrel performers in blackface managed to fill auditoriums and reinforce white supremacy at the very same time. In its infancy, Blackface minstrelsy had been a relatively simple affair. Before the Civil War, the recipe for a successful minstrel troupe was relatively straightforward. A row of chairs, a handful of performers, a few instruments, and a supply of burnt cork for makeup were all that was required. In the decades after the Civil War, however, the minstrel show underwent a fundamental transformation. The mammoth blackface extravaganzas of the Gilded Age were a far cry from the small-scale affairs that had delighted antebellum audiences. Late 19th century minstrel shows frequently featured dozens of performers, elaborate stage sets, and an endless stream of gimmicks and hijinks. You can see this is the Doc Stetter minstrel troupe uh, performing their levy scene. I mean, you see it's, it's several dozen performers, a, a backdrop, stage settings directly for this, this scene that they would have uh, brought out before this, this levy sketch. Though traditional white minstrel troops, that is white performers putting on blackface makeup to emulate African Americans, though traditional white troops continue to draw crowds after the Civil War, traditional blackface companies faced new competition. The increased involvement of African-American performers represented the single greatest innovation in postbellum minstrelsy. African-Americans had appeared on minstrel stages as early as the 1850s, but it was not until Reconstruction that black minstrel troops achieved sustained, sustained success and recognition. By the 1880s, the leading black minstrel troops were traveling the country in personalized railroad cars, playing before capacity crowds, and out earning many white minstrel troops. Such trends culminated in the rise of so called plantation shows, like this one called The South Before the War, which offered northern audiences a full length southern themed minstrel extravaganza. The South Before the War Company and their many competitors, uh, there was a production called Slavery Days that competed with the South Before the War Company. Um, these groups offered a spectacular but wholly unrealistic vision of slavery and the Southern Plantation on a nightly basis. 
1895, an African-American minstrel troupe went so far as to recreate a plantation village in South Brooklyn, New York. For the price of admission, New Yorkers were allowed to tour the plantation grounds and speak with the performers who were required to remain in character, playing the part of happy and contented plantation slaves. At Black America and elsewhere, minstrel troops were largely reiterating the stereotypes that had been on display on the minstrel stage for years. Whatever the race of the performers, Gilded Age minstrelsy was grounded in a vision of the South that misrepresented the region's past and its present. Tom shows were deeply influenced by these trends in minstrelsy. The first interracial production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which featured Sam Lucas, a star of the black minstrel stage, opened in 1880. From this point forward, Tom shows provided an important source of work for black performers. The involvement of African-American performers, in turn, encouraged productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin to present elaborate plantation scenes featuring cotton picking, jubilee singing, and slave dancing. You can see evidence of that in this advertisement here. Along with its double cast, its Siberian bloodhounds, and its educated donkeys, for example, an 1881 production presented a, quote, great cotton plantation festival featuring tableau, dancing, and three jubilee singing choruses. An 1886 performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin took place entirely outside on a lawn, quote, transformed into a plantation with fields of cotton, slaves at work, houses and cabins, and other distinguishing features of the land of Dixie, end quote. As they turned even Simon Legree's plantation, depicted in Harriet Beecher Stowe's text as a hellish factory in the fields, as they turned even Simon Legree's plantation into another opportunity for lavish spectacle and display, Gilded Age Tom shows proved just how unmoored they had come from the novel on which they were ostensibly based. By the 1890s, Uncle Tom's Cabin was little more than a vehicle for a series of outrageous theatrical novelties. Ironically, the familiarity of the story, again, Uncle Tom's Cabin is the best-selling novel of the 19th century, the familiarity of the story meant that audiences could largely ignore the plot. Northern audiences did not come to the theater to see what happened to Uncle Tom and Little Eva. They knew how the story ended long before they arrived. Audiences came instead to see how a particular production of Uncle Tom's Cabin would distinguish itself from all those that had come before. How fabulous would Eva's ascension to heaven be? How spectacular was the plantation dancing? How breathtaking was Eliza's dash across the ice? Off across the ice? How ferocious were the dogs? How hilarious was Topsy? For that matter, how many Topsies were there? In the midst of the carnival of, of excess that was a Gilded Age Tom show, the story itself largely disappeared. One did not go to a Tom show to see Uncle Tom's Cabin. One went to a Tom show to see the pageantry, spectacle, and one-upsmanship that invariably came with the production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. This fact had serious political consequences. Though slavery itself was dead by the 1880s and the 1890s, its memory was not. Depictions of the peculiar institution were alive and well on the northern stage. In this context, Uncle Tom's Cabin might have offered a powerful voice for racial justice in the South and in the nation. In stark contrast to the happy slaves and idealized race relations presented on the minstrel stage, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel depicted a brutal, dehumanizing labor regime that poisoned all those who came in contact with it. Even in the Gilded Age, a stage production of Uncle Tom's Cabin that remained true to the spirit of Stowe's original text could have offered a powerful corrective to the misrepresentations rampant in postbellum minstrelsy. At best, such a production might have offered a shining example of the political potency of popular art and rejuvenated Northern interest in racial democracy. At the very least, it could have offered a self-conscious alternative to the minstrel stage. Rather than a counterpoint to minstrelsy, however, Tom Shows offered a compliment to it. 
both cultural forms achieved significant popularity, largely by peddling idealized and unrealistic images of the Southern past. Less than 30 years after the close of the Civil War, Northern theatrical promoters proved willing to sacrifice history on the altar of entertainment. Gilded Age Tom shows whitewashed the violence of slavery, idealized Southern race relations, and denied the significance of emancipation and reconstruction. In so doing, they rationalized Northern inaction in the face of Southern racial strife and refuted the possibility of African American equality in the age of Jim Crow. Performance culture, of course, was only one site at which the nature of the South was debated and contested in the years after 1877. In the context of the continuing assault on African American civil and political rights, however, one should not overlook the significance of the stories of the South presented on the Northern stage. Through sheer repetition and familiarity, the thoroughly unreconstructed visions of the Southern past presented in Northern performance culture were deeply woven into the region's consciousness. As white Northerners considered their response to the Jim Crow regime put in place after 1890, they carried this cultural baggage with them. Looking back on the Civil War in the mid-1880s, the white Virginian novelist Thomas Nelson Page would offer the following explanation for Confederate, uh, Confederate, de Confederate defeat. Page said this, he said, quote, only study the course of the contest against the South and you cannot fail to see how she was conquered by the pen rather than by the sword, end quote. The South, Page reasons, had failed to explain its cause to the nation, a failure of storytelling that had brought about the war and guaranteed Confederate defeat. Though his historical analysis was somewhat suspect in this manner, uh, I do think Thomas Nelson Page was on to, to something. As students of the past, we would do well to attend to the pen, as well as the sword. Culture, stories, can tell us an awful lot about the rise and fall of Reconstruction. To focus solely on politics, as most historians of the period have done, is to miss half the battle. We must also account for the creation, dissemination, and reception of a new set of images of the South. Such images will not displace the traditional political narrative of Reconstruction and its aftermath. They will enrich it. In the end, politics and culture are not opposed. They are intimately related and need to be understood collectively if we are to truly grasp the nature and timing of the nation's retreat from Reconstruction. The final crowning of white supremacy in the South and in the United States was a product of narration, storytelling, and cultural production just as surely as violence, legislation, and voter suppression. To conclude then, I return to what I consider to be my book's most significant argument and also its most simple. Culture matters. Stories are not ancillary affairs, mere byproducts of some sort of real history. Stories are the essence of human existence. To recognize their power is to add immeasurably to our understanding of the past and to shed new light on more traditional aspects of historical inquiry. Culture gives meaning to politics and shape to social realities. Stories are not outside of history. They are history. Thanks.